Good morning. Welcome to Constructing on Impervious Surfaces, BMPs for Runoff Quality and Quantity. I'm Dave Jenkins. I'll be the presenter today. Uh, this webinar is put on by the Pacific Northwest Chapter of the International Erosion Control Association. And uh, let's get started. I've got a few slides before we get into the guts of this thing, just to go over a couple of uh, items. First off, with the shameless promotion, uh, please check out our website, pnwciec.org, for information on chapter membership, upcoming webinars, and a whole bunch of other stuff. As far as membership, if any of you are students, current full-time students, you can join for 25 bucks a year, which is nothing. You can probably get your parents to pay for that. Uh, if you're old like me, you can qualify for the $65 uh, annual membership. So I have to forego a haircut once in a while so I can afford that. And if you're a young professional, 115 per year. Uh, so less than 10 bucks a month. If you're a professional, uh, you can probably get your company to pay for it. So please look into it. Uh, if you're interested in erosion control at all, if you're, uh, if you're, if that's something you're doing a lot of, or you want to learn more about, it's a great uh, association to join. Okay. And thank you to our sponsors who make this possible, uh, who help pay our bills so we can continue. This webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel, which can be accessed through our website. Um, go ahead and use the chat function if you have any questions as we go. And um, I'll try to get to them as we continue. Uh, if not, I'll get them get to them at the end. Okay, so I'm Dave Jenkins. I'm a certified professional in erosion uh, erosion and sediment control. I've been in the heavy civil infrastructure public works contracting world for 30 years with 27 total at the Port of Seattle and three at Department of Transportation. All of it has been related to erosion control, stormwater, or general environmental like habitat restoration. I got my certification four years ago, and uh, I would recommend if any of you are wanting to get your erosion certification, uh, don't wait till you're 65 to get it. It's uh, the brain doesn't work quite as well. So anyway, a few things to consider as we're going through this material: uh, stormwater management manuals, uh, such as the Department of Ecology manual for Western Washington. Uh, from what I gather, what I can tell, you will not find BMPs for specifically for working on asphalt. You'll find BMPs for working on dirt, uh, but not really for working around asphalt. So <clears throat> that's one of the reasons I put this together. Um, try to use site materials rather than go off site and purchase things. And I'll show some examples of that as we go. Um, my personal Soapbox is used by bio biodegradable materials whenever possible, uh, or and or reusable and recyclable materials such as asphalt, which I'll cover quite a bit. And then combine various materials. Be creative. Make things work for you. So a lot of the things that I'm going to show, um, I've learned from contractors who have just figured it out because they need to make something work. So I'm not going to talk a lot about water quality. Uh, except to say when you're working on or around asphalt, you have to be diligent to keep the asphalt clean. Um, if you keep the asphalt clean, you're not going to have water quality issues. So this is really critical. I can't overstress it. Uh, so vacuum sweeping frequently, uh, laborers with brooms, cleaning up messes as they happen, uh, anything and everything to keep the site clean. But there's also means and methods and practices you can use uh, that will help keep it clean in the first place. So pre preventive measures, which I will go over. Water quantity is a bigger issue on uh, projects with asphalt. Of course, any rain that hits asphalt is going to run off. Uh, and one inch of rain on one acre, acre of asphalt equals the volume of one and a third roll-off tanks. So 20, roughly 27,000 gallons. So you can do the math. If you have a 10 acre site, 15 acre site, uh, if you get five inches of rain, if you have to work through winter or something and you're gonna be dealing with a lot of rain, you're dealing with a lot of water. If you're keeping the site clean and, and being diligent, 
uh, you might be able to discharge that directly from the site. If not, you might have to consider treatment or some other thing like infiltration, which I also will cover. So I'm going to start off with uh, prevention. Keep your site paved. In, in this particular project, this road surface is going to go away at some point. Contractor chose to keep it in place as long as possible so that they could use it for, um, for their access road, keeping truck tires clean. So dirty vehicles on the dirty side, clean vehicles on the asphalt, and don't cross the two. So this this has worked out. I've seen this work on so many projects over the years uh, to be diligent. Now, if you have to deliver materials to the site, uh, same thing, have your delivery trucks stay on the asphalt. You might have to call a dispatch ahead of time and let them know. And have a, have your forklift unload the trucks on the dirty side while the delivery truck stays on the asphalt. Or even uh, specify side dump trucks to deliver gravel, quarry spalls, other materials like that. They stay on asphalt, dump to the side, and equipment moves the material to where it needs to go. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is get it paved at least one lift of asphalt as soon as possible. I do have examples of this. Um, I've, I've seen contractors pave staging areas just with you know asphalt treated base, so relatively inexpensive stuff, just so they don't have to deal with mud and track out and a bunch of other stuff. So um, get the pavement down as quickly as you can and use that as a work surface until your project is complete. Another important issue is to manage your subcontractors. So uh, you have your landscapers scheduled to come out and uh, you know that they're gonna have to bring out a bunch of special landscape soil. Um, work with them on where you want it uh, placed while they're installing it, especially if you're gonna be working in the wet months. Uh, you don't want the landscaper just sending their trucks in and dumping wherever. So this is what I mean by being diligent about keeping your asphalt clean. It doesn't matter how well you sweep, once it gets dirty like this, you're going to have dirty runoff. Another example, small example, but uh, it can be an issue. So you've got your fence sub coming out, they've got a drill for the fence posts. And rather than pick up the dirt, put it in a wheelbarrow and put it in a stockpile somewhere, just leave it on the uh, surrounding impervious surface. And uh, you can tell that this soil is wet. It's been rained on quite a few times. So um, even small things like this are critical when you're working around impervious surface. Most of what you're going to use are really perimeter controls. So when you're working a dirt job, uh, one of the main perimeter controls you would use is silt fence, for example. Well, since you can't use silt fence on asphalt, you've got to have alternatives. So perimeter controls are, are really important, and uh, I'll talk quite a bit about those. What are perimeter controls? Uh, they define a perimeter, basically, either the entire project perimeter or even smaller work areas within your overall project perimeter. Uh, the purpose of them is to keep clean water out, keep dirty water in, keep sediment in. So I'm gonna start off with those, uh, and in particular, I'm a big fan of asphalt curbs and berms, hot mix asphalt, cold mix asphalt, um, anything, uh, because for, for many reasons, it's readily available, uh, relatively inexpensive, and it can be recycled when you're done with it. Several ways to get this into a project, get asphalt curbs or any kind of uh, BMPs, of course, that uh, the engineer designs it into the plan sheets, the original contract. So this is my chicken scratch uh, notes to the designer on, on what I want to see on this project. But I wanted to point out the extruded asphalt berm kind of in the lower right in green. Uh, and I'll show that I think next, but uh, it's a few interesting things about that. Yeah. So this particular project, um, we are using the left side of the this berm as staging area. We assume that it is going to get somewhat dirty because of the nature of the work we're doing. Um, and then the area to the right of the berm is clean water runoff from the neighbor's property. 
which we don't want in the staging area. Hence the reason for putting the berm in there. So one thing you need to keep in mind on these types of projects, you need to become really familiar with the drainage system. You need to know how the drainage system works. Uh, for example, on this one, the drainage system for this area consists of two catch basins in one line. So catch basin to the left in the corner where that uh, barrel is, is the end of the line. We've got that blocked. So any dirty water that gets to that catch basin is going to be collected, pumped uh, to a on-site treatment system. And then the next catch basin in line is to the right of the berm, immediately to the right. And that's going to collect clean water, and that's going to go right into the swale where the trees are. So we've used this as a separation. We don't want to be getting off-site water, off-site clean water dirty, and then have to treat it. So that's the purpose of this. Um, at SeaTac International Airport, where I did most of my work at the Port of Seattle, uh, lots of concrete, hundreds and hundreds of acres of imper impervious surface. And concrete has to be replaced a lot. Concrete panels, uh, they wear out. So there's lots of this type of work going on all the time. So we engineer in extruded asphalt curbing to keep hundreds and thousands of gallons of water from draining into the work areas and diverting it elsewhere. Another example of that, you can see all the impervious to the right. Uh, we're diverting it into the grassy area and pumping it uh, downstream, basically, or down ditch from the work area. So we keep the clean water out. Another way to achieve uh, these methods is con contractor field design, which is how a lot of these came about. And, and I learned a lot from contractors over the years. So the plan showed silt fence, continuous silt fence run here. Contractor scratched their head and said, yeah, well, this is asphalt. How's that going to work? And uh, they said, we'll just put a rolled hot mix asphalt berm across so that everything's diverted to the sump and pump in the background there. Another example of that, uh, making a water line connection on a project, and they've contained the area, they've isolated the area using asphalt berms, not extruded, just asphalt placed and uh, and rolled on uh, with, with equipment to compact it a little bit. So it's keeping the street runoff directed to a catch basin, and then it's keeping the uh, work area isolated where they collect the water and pump it back into the project. And then the third method for getting things done is the inspector yelling. So, uh, when, and in this case, this would be me saying, you know, you, yeah, I understand you had to pull the curb to put the your pipe connection in, but you need to put some temporary curb back in in the meantime. Or in this example, uh, I know you're doing your best, but there's still dirty water leaving the site and you own that water, so you have to collect it. So put in something to do that. And this is what they did. Not the preferred method. The other two, the first two are the preferred methods, but. Okay, so with that, let's get into some specific things you can do. I welcome somebody from the waiting room here. Hi, Andrew, it's been a long time. Hope things are going well. Um, so curbs and gutters, get your curbs and gutters in early and often. So um, here's an example. I've got a couple examples of that, and then I'll go into this particular project later. So the main source of pro potential problems on this project is road runoff, clean road runoff and uh, running off. And if this is being done in the rainy season, then clean runoff screaming down this uh, this gravel area, crushed rock area, and then leaving to go into a stream somewhere. So get your curbs in and then get the asphalt in as soon as possible. And you can just write that off your list of things you have to worry about. So here you go, example. So just a little bit of asphalt here. Uh, asphalt and curbs again, get them in early. And in this case, they scooped out some extra area on the landscape side of the curb so that they've got potential for some infiltration, but also for, from some storage of dirty water. Speaking of in, infiltration, this is something that pretty late in my career, um, 
myself and a particular contractor kind of figured out this is what we needed to do. So I've got some examples of that here. A uh, very large project here. It's uh, in this phase, it's about 15 acres or so of impervious and essentially flat. Um, what we ended up doing is covering the catch basins with heavy plastic. So nothing got in the system because it wasn't, it wasn't our system. It belonged to somebody else that they were uh, regulated for discharges. Well, now what are we going to do with all this water? Um, infiltrate it. So we thought we'd try that. Break out asphalt, get down to the sub base, scrape up the sub base a little bit uh, to uncompact it a little, put some rock in there so you can drive over it and let the water drain and it worked great. So all of the catch basins in this project uh, were managed this way. We had an emergency where we had to uh, stockpile a bunch of rock and, and mud and stuff that we had to muck out to be able to drive piles. Um, it was all going to go back in place, but we needed some staging for uh, just a month or so. Rather than haul it off, pay to haul it off, pay to uh, store it, pay to bring it back and all that, uh, came up with the... Uh, cut the asphalt and let the water drain. Uh, this also worked great. Um, I can't say that we didn't have overflow at times because I wasn't there all the time. Uh, this was not designed and I would I would encourage you if, if you're not in an emergency situation to consider infiltration and actually design it, work with an engineer on uh, you know what the infiltration rate of the subgrade would be, um, how much area you need of infiltration for the area that you're gonna uh, drain to it, things like that. We didn't have time to do any of that on this and uh, it still worked, worked well for us. Okay, sandbags, uh, lots of uses for sandbags. Um, I'm gonna show some pictures that are fairly old, some of them, um, and these aren't necessarily how I would do the work now, but sandbags are easily uh, obtained and uh, movable. So this project, which I will go over later, um, also we wanted to keep a lot of street runoff out of the work area. So sandbags were used to bypass all of that clean runoff away from the work area. Um, one of the downsides to installing impervious surface like asphalt is it increases your runoff to 100%, as I mentioned earlier. Knowing that you're going to be paving, walk your site and look for things like this. Where's the water going to drain when it rains before we get all of the curbs uh, and everything in? So here, this in this case, everything is going to drain up slope from here down into a wetland where the trees are. Well, we can't have that. So let's put in a temporary sandbag curb until we uh, are ready to put in the final, all the final stuff. This is one of those I would use uh, asphalt now instead of sandbags, but it worked. Uh, the, the city we were working in, we had to put in some utilities. Uh, the city requirements were for silt fence, perimeter controls. We asked how we're going to install silt fence on asphalt. They said, we don't know, but you have to do it. And we talked to them again and again and said, how about we use something other like uh, sandbags? They finally agreed. So uh, this is the saw cut portion. Uh, they did vacuum. It looks pretty messy, but they did vacuum as they went on this one. So, um, so yeah, a thing to consider. Good afternoon, Adam. And if you have a situation where you need to move, for, in this case, Jersey barriers, depending on the phasing of the project, uh, something that's movable rather than easily movable rather than sandbags or asphalt. Um, I believe this was hmm, this this actually was either crushed rock that the contractor placed on silt fence fabric and then rolled over it and then installed the sandbags to hold it in place. Uh, it could have been a straw wattle or compost berm or something in there. I don't remember what, but it was easily movable. Speaking of straw wattles, um, please don't ever use straw wattles on asphalt for any reason. Um, number one, 
it doesn't meet the installation requirements for straw wattles in the stormwater manual, which requires that you trench them in and stake them. But also water gets under them, goes under them, goes through them, goes around them. They just don't work. So if you're trying to contain your site, trying to keep clean water out, dirty water in, these are not the things to use at all. And I even wrote a little spec for you. Straw water shall not be placed on impervious surfaces. So that's your freebie for today. A uh, better option is compost socks. Uh, the, this is compost placed in uh, in a plastic mesh or polyester mesh material. Um, they, If they're taken care of, they can last quite a while. They hug to the ground because of the weight. And as they get wet, they get um, heavier. So they really stick to the uh, impervious surface. And as you can see, water's building up behind it on the right and slowly drain, draining out through it. So it's a good option. On this particular project, we used thousands and thousands of feet of this stuff um, to great effect. Uh, the, one of the beauties of it too, actually, depending on what project you're working on, uh, theoretically, you could cut the mesh and dump the compost into landscaped areas for reuse. So less, uh, less stuff you have to landfill. Uh, another contractor provided material. We specified asphalt berms on this job. The contractor asked if they could use something that they'd used on other jobs, uh, water berms. These are really spill control or spill containment uh, devices. They're just polyvinyl chloride uh, tubes that you can fill with water. Um, they can last a long time if you're careful with them, like if you don't drag them around the asphalt when they're full of water, uh, you know, things like that. This contractor had, had these particular ones for quite a while, but they're great for diverting water containing sites. This is one of the contractors that kept dragging these things around and then complaining how they don't last very long. Uh, but same idea. It's it's quick, simple, uh, reusable if you are careful. I mentioned using site materials. This is one of those examples. Uh, this was a road extension or you know extending the width of the road, and of course you're putting down crushed rock uh, base. Well, bring a little extra in and blade it so you've got a berm along the edge, um, and that will keep stuff from your Unfortunately, it would become dirty, but uh, the screaming runoff from your site down into the dirt area to the left, it'll contain that. So I, I saw this used a lot on highway jobs, actually, purposely or not purposely. This, this happened quite a bit um, where they had gravel berms along the road edges. And then what I call edges, for lack of a better name, anytime you grind asphalt, um, and of course remove it, but even just grinding it, you can end up with a six to 12 inch lip with the surrounding asphalt. And that becomes a containment for your, your work area. This is going to be all excavated out to put in some major utilities. Um, we did install compost socks along the asphalt edge on both sides, but it wasn't really necessary. So consider that too. You, you do potentially have edges, and in this case, there's infiltration. Uh, utility work, if you're working, say in this case, we're working probably in the spring, and it's a wet spring. Um, you don't necessarily need to fill up your utility trenches right away. This one happens to be pretty close to the outer project boundary. So it was used, left in place, and used to allow uh, stormwater runoff to drain into it until it wasn't raining anymore. Uh, this same idea with this contractor uh, didn't put the asphalt curb uh, in until quite a bit late in the project. So what they were doing was they had this area excavated out for a future utility and they used it to collect water and then pumped it. They had an on-site treatment system uh, that they were using. So and then they thought, well, why are we treating all this water? Why don't we just bypass it? Uh, and they put in a, it doesn't look very pretty, but um, it worked as a containment berm or diversion berm, I guess. And here's one that I saw one contractor do. We had specified uh, extruded asphalt curbing. Contractor really didn't want to do that. We never figured out 
why they didn't, but they said, we've used this on other projects. Um, it's, I forget the name of it. It's, it's welded pipe, basically. It's like four inch diameter. And they seeded the pipe in um, spray foam. And they had fittings on the ends of the pipe so that they could dump water in them to hold it in place. And you can see that it worked. It worked well for the most part. There were areas where they didn't put enough spray foam in. Um, I've also seen this done with fire hose. So the special, the flexible fire hose, rather than the heavy canvas, um, use, use the hose, put water in the hose and let it sit. Should have mentioned too, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Um, and then at the end of the project, I'll address them. Or if you think of questions at the end, uh, we'll hang tight and address any questions you have. So projects. Here you can see, by the way, there's the edge on the left. Okay, terminal radar approach control building at SeaTac. Um, you can see the curb, the gravel, learned they've installed gravel, they're rolling the gravel. What you can't really tell though is in the background where the building is, all those vehicles, they are parked on asphalt. So one of the first things the contractor did was place the curbs, got the storm system in and then placed curbs and one lift of asphalt in that entire area so that that was their work surface. Um, and then not too long after they got the first lift in um, everywhere else so that the only dirt left was landscaped areas um, around the building and in the parking islands. As a, a side note, just want to point out the fence posts. If you're going to be installing fence on a project, uh, work it so that the posts are installed before you hydro seed. Because if you wait to get the fence guy out there to do all of the fence work uh, and you've hydro seeded, it's all going to get torn up. So this contractor was thinking ahead and they mobilized twice, once to install posts and second to install the fabric. And by the time the fabric was installed, they had a good stand of grass out here. Uh, the project near my house, actually, uh, it's a small, it's about two acres. This contractor um, planned from day one how they were going to do this so that they wouldn't have problems. And one of the plans was the grass. They actually hydro seeded in the summer. It was a fairly hot summer and had a laborer out there hosing it to get the grass growing. So going into the wet season that this year started in probably mid-October, um, they had three inches, four inches of grass already on the slopes. But the other important thing was the asphalt. Um, they got one lift of asphalt down as soon as possible. So um, that's where they sit. This is taken a few weeks ago. Uh, they've got the bioswales in the center. So drainage from the asphalt is draining into the bioswale and into an infiltration gallery. But they, they planned all of the stormwater features um, and how they were going to manage it from day one. So I was really impressed with this one. Okay, back to this project. So landscaping on the right, uh, sandbags, diverting water, but there's also up under the second bridge in the background there, there's a big sandbag check dam to divert clean ditch water out uh, to the outside edge of the other sandbags so that everything was diverted. The only thing, only water that had to be dealt with on the project then were uh, was rainwater that fell on it. And then the site water was actually collected uh, right there and then pumped into a grassy area. I mentioned uh, at the airport, a lot of concrete placement, relocation, things like that is, is done all the time. So this was relocating a taxiway. And again, extruded asphalt curbing to keep water out and uh, this one wasn't quite long enough, but um, keep water in the grassy areas on either side of the work area to be pumped so that you just have to deal with what's falling on it from the sky. This was extension of the north terminal at SeaTac, and um, it required working in the yellow area to the left of the current uh, satellite. And you see that going on here. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Um, 
you can see the work area being developed. This is fairly early on in the project, but what they did was extruded curbing and Jersey barriers all the way around the work area to keep water out and to contain water in. Uh, they've started digging. There's going to be a big basement area. So they're excavating out. I don't remember 20, 10, 20, 30,000 yards of material. Uh, they're keeping their, their haul trucks on uh, temporary asphalt so that they can load out and drive out without tracking. We, at the airport, you cannot have anything tracked out onto the airfield at all FAA requirements because you don't want stuff getting sucked into jet engines. So site has to be spotless. Okay, I've already shown a couple pictures of this. This is phase one of a major seaport terminal upgrade. Uh, this part of the project is about 15 acres, all impervious. So, for example, the fact the site was so large and our office was so far away, we got to use these little putt-putts on the right, the little golf cart things to cruise around. So here's another example of the infiltration. Um, all of the asphalt was ground out for future utility location. Uh, they left the ground asphalt uh, so that they could drive around, you know, wherever they wanted and not have to uh, dodge holes in the ground. Uh, but it also worked for infiltration. So we blocked off all of the catch basins and allowed the infiltration. By the way, this project is still going on. I think they're on phase two or phase three now. So multi-year, multi-winter, uh, having to deal with rain for many years on this one. Uh, here's, I think I showed this earlier. So another example. And the infiltration trench for the riprap. Um, we had to break, break up a lot of concrete panels on this project to haul off site for crushing. Uh, so they broke them here on the project and then pulled out the rebar and such and then hauled it off for, to the crusher. Uh, this initial effort to contain the site didn't work so well. Um, you probably already, already know this, but if you're doing anything with concrete, fresh concrete or even long cured 30-year-old concrete that you're breaking up, the any water that lands on it excuse me, it's going to have elevated pH up to possibly 10, 10 and a half, which is, what, 100 times more uh, alkaline than you're allowed to discharge. So working with the contractor, this is what they did, Jersey barriers, um, asphalt contained, and then uh, all the water was pumped to the on-site treatment system for treatment for pH. Uh, this, was, this was a fun one. Uh, had to remove some buildings on the approach to a runway. Um, I mentioned earlier, really understand your storm system. Um, and this was a perfect example of that. So it's just over an acre of impervious. We were allowed to leave the foundation so, so that we didn't have any exposed dirt. Uh, so we took the concrete tilt up building down, um, broke it up and hauled it off. But the way the storm system works, including the rain leaders, everything ends up to uh, draining to one structure that's in the blue at the top of the picture here. We were able to plug that, uh, set up a pH treatment system, a couple of tanks, uh, use dry ice to treat the pH, and then discharge it uh, into a downstream manhole. So this worked out. This worked out well. Um, something to consider. So all, everything, uh, we didn't really have turbidity issues so much because it was all concrete, but for, for this one, it was specific to pH. Um, so understand your storm system. Small project, parking lot extension, uh, storm drains to the right, drainage to the right from the edge of asphalt. And then on the dirt side, the, the drainage is toward the camera. So contractor asked for help on what they were going to do and said, keep your trucks on the asphalt when you're loading out. Don't let them drive on the, this little area. Number one. Number two, manage your drainage. So what they did was um, excavated along the edge of asphalt, laid some plastic in and then rock and used that for a drainage ditch basically toward the camera. And then this rock area at the bottom of the picture, they set up a trash pump and pumped into a grassy area nearby. So they were able to contain it that way. 
Uh, just I showed this earlier, it's just another view of that same utility relocation. So looking from where the sump pump is set up, um, you can see uh, how this all works. And that is it. Wow, I managed to get in just about 30 minutes, which I was hoping for. So back to the shameless promotion, check out our website, pnwciec.org uh, for more information on uh, the chapter and upcoming webinars, access to our YouTube channel, et cetera. Um, thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Hope you got some ideas out of this that will be useful to you. Uh, please, again, check our website for upcoming. We try to do webinars once a month on uh, various erosion, stormwater, and environmental-related topics. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate it.